And today we are looking for a few minutes at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 to 16, about one of the biggest all-time losers in the Bible. Lost it all by choice. You know, sometimes we, we often mention Abraham, Isaac, and who's the third person? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, it could have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But Esau botched it up. And so now we talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's possible for you to miss God's purpose for your life. Don't just fatalistically think that everything will be all right. That's not true. Everything will not be all right. Who said everything will be all right? That's not in the Bible. Everything may not be all right. But you say, I botched it up. Is there hope for me? Yes, there is hope for you because from the point of your discovery, that you mess it up for the rest of your life with certain limitations God can make your life more purposeful than it could ever have been because God is a God of restoration God is a God of hope God is a God of redemption God's ultimate purpose is not to laugh over you as you mess it up, but to weep over you because you have messed it up, and then to reach out to you to bring you back to where he wants you to be. And the amazing thing about God is that sometimes in the years that we have left in our lives, he does something for us that in a sense compensates for all that we have lost. In reality, what you've lost, you've lost. But God can make you a victorious person. That's the wonder of our God. Because he can convert any situation into one that will bring glory to him. Now well, let's look at Esau, a loser. And the reason I'm talking about the loser is because I don't want to be a loser. Do you? Do you? No, I don't want to be a loser. I can learn from the losers, though. Like the Apostle Paul said, all these examples are there for our benefit so that we can learn from these losers how we can be winners. And we don't have to make the mistakes they did. Now, why I'm telling you this? But sometimes we think like this. I'm sure some of you are thinking like that, and that's why I'm proud to say this. Sometimes you do things that hurt you and hurt others. As a kind of a retaliatory course of action. But you know who hurts the most? You. If you say to yourself, I'm going to teach my parents a lesson, I'm going to teach my wife a lesson, I'm going to teach my husband a lesson, I'm going to do this because I want them to hurt, at the end of the day, you're the one who's going to hurt the most. You're the loser. And if you're thinking like that right now, change it and let the Word of God as I share help you. Change that attitude. Nobody else is going to hurt more than you. So let's read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 to 16 about this loser. Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this 
many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. There's a kind of a concept there that needs a little explanation, and that is about the birthright. What is the birthright? The birthright in the Old Testament times, in patriarchal times especially, was the right of the firstborn. The oldest got a double portion of the inheritance. So if there were three children, the father divided the inheritance four ways and gave two portions to the oldest and the other two to the second and third kid. And then there was a second, more important dimension to the birthright. Because in Old Testament times, the patriarch or the father was actually the one who was in covenant relationship with God. Well, there is a New Testament dimension to it where we always say that the father or the chief occupant is like the priest or the pastor of the home. You have heard that many times. You are the leader. Don't abdicate that leadership. Be responsible about the spiritual leadership the Lord has given to you. But in the Old Testament times, they're more formal. And uh, God used the patriarch, the Old Testament, uh, the, the father of the home, who was in covenant relationship with God to transmit the message and the blessing to his posterity. The very, very important dimension of the birthright, the spiritual dimension. Not only did you get much of the property, you also had the responsibility to be the spiritual leader. To cut a long story short, Esau, though he was the oldest, he despised his birthright. He rejected it. He didn't take it seriously. To him, his own passions, his own pursuits, and his own pleasure was of greater importance than the purpose that God had for him. Even today, there are men and women who despise their birthright. What is the birthright today? God has a purpose for your life based on your covenant relationship with Him. And by the choices we make, by the decisions we make, by the pursuits in life of our own passions that sometimes override God's purpose for our lives, either actively or passively, we despise our birthright. And so because we want to pursue our passions, we take lightly the call to serve. And we always think that somebody else will do it, not us. Let me tell you, it's a lot of little things that cause big issues in people's lives. And a little rejection, a little casualty about a situation, a little dismissal, of an opportunity that comes your way. There are more serious ones as far as despise the birthright is concerned, but here's one that can affect your life. You just reject it. We despise the birthright. And in the process, 
What happens is we miss God's purpose. In these four or five verses, the writer of Hebrews tells how you can travel on the highway of holiness and ensure that you don't collapse and you don't lapse and capitulate to common simple issues that can make you stumble along the way. So what's the first thing? The first thing is heal your handicaps, he says. The hanging hands, the knocking knees, the lame legs that you have in your life is not talking about physical handicaps he's talking about spiritual handicaps for some people it's white lies there are no white lies it's either true or false okay but some people have perfected the art of making false implications complicating matters of giving impressions that are not true of withholding information so that people come to another conclusion. Or when questions say, I forgot about it, you didn't forget about it. You knew it. But it's easy to say, I forgot about it. Or you can say, oh, I didn't know it. You knew it. These are things in our cultures that are not considered too bad. And if Christianity does not address the cultural issues, it addresses nothing at all. In our types of cultures, giving false impressions to save face, telling white lies, and presuming and pretending ignorance about situations are not considered too bad, as long as you don't consider do the big sins that everybody sees. These are actually handicaps in our lives. And I'm not telling you as if I've fixed it all in my life. But the longer I'm in the Lord, I realize what a pile of garbage I can be, except for the grace of God. Except for the grace of God. And unless the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is allowed to have full sway in my life, I will go on and on and on and assume wrongly, erroneously, that the blessings that God gives to me because of His grace are an authentication of the way I live. That conclusion is totally wrong. Because if you're a child and you're displeasing your parents, they'll still supply your needs, right? They'll still pay your bills. They'll still lift you up when you're fallen. They'll still protect you against unruly people. And that is not an authentication of your lifestyle. On the contrary, it is an expression of their love. And then there is this, ironically, that is so true, that the child who is disobedient and uh, who is rebellious sometimes is shown even more love. That is a reflection of the nature of God. Because like I said last Sunday, when the children of Israel were bickering and backbiting and grumbling against God and were unfaithful to Him, what did He do? He fed them with manna from above. He sent quails. Their clothes never got wasted. He gave them water out of the rock. Was that an authentication of their backbiting, grumbling, bickering life? No, because God does miracles for those who don't deserve them. That's why when you preach the gospel to unbelievers, they see wonders, not because they deserve it. So first thing is heal your handicaps. Second thing he says, verse 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, what have people got to do with our holiness? Well, the reality is that it's people who lead us to sin and people who are also uh, the people who stir us to walk with God. Angels don't come and help us 
to walk with God. It's people who encourage us, and it's people who discourage us. But fractured relationships can affect your holiness. When the enemy knows that some person can add to your life and lead you on the path to fulfill God's purpose for your life, you can almost count on it that he will try to cause a fracture in your relationship with that person. Did you get it? So look closely at your fractured relationships, especially if it has to do with people who love the Lord or authority figures in your life. And you have some misgivings and so on. Remember that the very thing that is bothering you right now could have been a blessing if you discerned it properly. And the enemy's strategy is to cause conflict rather than peace. So this a statement here, without which no man will see the Lord, has two dimensions to it. It is true that because the Lord is holy, because the Lord is holy, only holy people will see him, not in their own holiness, but in the holiness of the Lord. There's a second dimension to it. That is that unless there is holiness in you, men will not see the Lord. Do you get it? Unless you are a holy person, men will not, and women, human beings around you, will not see the Lord because the only way they will see the Lord is through your life. So if you're a conflict-riddled person, then people who do not know the Lord will not see the Lord in you. I don't know what problems there were in Esau's family, but obviously there was some friction because that family was virtually split in two. Isaac was on one side and Rebecca was on the other side. Jacob was mama's boy and Esau was daddy's favorite. There are two different personalities. And there was apparently sibling rivalry, which is a terrible thing. Maybe there was some anger between uh, Esau and Jacob. Maybe when Esau was a man of the field, that was his big passion. He, that's, that's all he cared for, to spend time out in the field. He was a great hunter. He was good at getting game and came back. When he came back with the, with the game, he probably didn't share anything with Jacob. It's possible. Okay? He just uh, gave some to his dad and ate the rest of it and didn't share. That's probably why when he was hungry, and the whole story is found from Genesis chapter 25 to 27, when, when Esau came from the field one day, probably without game, and he was hungry, and he asked Jacob, for some stew or lentil soup, dal soup. <laughs> Jacob said, what are you going to give me in return? But if they had a good relationship and they were sharing with each other and they had a harmony in, among themselves, Jake would have said, hey, no problem, man. You take it all if you want it. On the other hand, Jacob used that as a bargaining tool. And at that point, Esau lost it all. Sometimes people lose it all, not because the other guy is better, but because they are bad. Jacob was no better than Esau in a sense. He was a cheat. That was the story of his life. But Esau lost it all because he had a different value system. Now let's talk about that for a little bit. Your value system or what you hold dear in your life is what ultimately causes you to make certain choices. And your value system is a cumulative thing. You get it from your parents and your environment and so on. 
but then most of all, you are responsible for the things that you hold dear in your life. What is valuable to you is what will make you decide whether you're going to serve God or pursue your passions. And those are things that you decide as the years go by. And in the case of Esau, he was not interested in cementing his relationship with his family. He was not interested in anything else but to pursue his passion. And he was out all the time. He was a man of the field. In other words, he was given over to the field or, or to his own profession. And he had built that value system, a wrong value system into his life. You couldn't see it or discern it until it came to a critical point. What was the critical point? The critical point when he was hungry because he despised spiritual things, because he despised a covenant relationship with God which he was entitled to and he was responsible for all those years. He never spent any time probably thinking about his responsibility as the, as the next generation of the person who should be in covenant relationship with God. He had thrown that out of his life. Therefore, therefore, at a critical point, when he was just hungry, and Jacob told him, give me your birthright. The despising posture that Esau had towards spiritual things was verbalized. And he said, what good is this birthright to me? Give me that lentil soup. And he released everything he had physically, monetarily, and spiritually as well. Can we do that? Of course. If the Holy Spirit is calling you to salvation, you don't know Jesus as your personal savior. And you're hearing beyond my words the voice of the Holy Spirit who is calling you to come to him. It's your birthright to be born again. It's the birthright of every human being to respond to the call of God and come to Jesus and get saved from the guttermost to the uttermost. Be totally transformed. But you can despise that birthright. You can say to yourself, no, I don't want it. Some people can reject the birthright. Others can value the birthright regardless of what anybody is saying or thinking. You reject the birthright when you are given an opportunity to serve God and you treat it lightly. There are so many areas of ministry and service that are unmanned and unwomaned. <laughs> Because people despise or take lightly their birthright to serve God. I don't know who they are, but you know who you are. And God knows. You reject and despise your birthright. And listen to me carefully. When God's call is upon you to serve him full time. I don't like the term because we are all full time Christians, but let's say for purposes of clarification, you know God is calling you to give up your job or profession. Prepare yourself and throw yourself into the hands of God.
to serve him. The call is there, but you don't do it because, because you don't want to take that step of faith and trust God to supply your needs. You have more faith in yourself. And so, on a balance, you have on the one hand the purpose and the call of God, and on the other hand, you have the security of your own income and large portions of disposable income which you always want to have access to. And you know that this step will deny you that. And so you make a choice. Passively, of course, you're not going to tell anybody about it. Passive rebellion. God doesn't distinguish and put a different value on whether he's active or passive. Rebellion is rebellion. And so we passively rebel against God. But only God knows it, nobody else sees it, because you don't utter a word about it. You don't tell anyone about it. So when the call of God comes into your life and you despise it, you are despising your birthright. You despise your birthright when you don't deal with your handicaps, when you don't heal your fractured relationships, and when you make decisions in your life that satisfy and gratify your profane passions versus the purpose of God. And it's interesting, the words that are used by the writer of Hebrews about Esau. He did what seemed like a very legitimate thing, and he did what seemed like a favor for Jacob. But yet for all, the writer of Hebrews says, lest there be among you any fornicator, any immoral person, or profane person who for a bowl of soup despised his birthright. I don't know what your bowl of soup is. But I do know whatever it is, it's not worth missing the purpose of God. Whatever your bowl of soup may be. It may be a great life. I'm not saying that people who despise their birthright suffer. They don't. They have a whale of a time. They have many happy hours. And they achieve all their uh, goals materially and professionally. Don't think that people who, who don't follow Christ are suffering. They will suffer someday. But God is fair. He lets them enjoy this life, at least for 60, 70 years. God is not going to bop you on the head because you don't pursue his purpose. On the other hand, every goal that you have may be achieved, but you're out of it. You're out of it totally. Because when you do, God calls you a profane person, a fornicator, a person who has despised the birth. I, for one, do not want to ever be in those shoes. And I, don't, I know you don't either, okay? And the reason I'm telling you this is not to condemn you, but to help you. Because this is what God wants us to hear today. He wants us to seriously think about his purpose for our lives. And even if it means healing certain relationships, even if it means being honest about our handicaps, even if it means putting things right, even if it means retooling ourselves spiritually about the way we make decisions. So many Christians make decisions based on circumstances. If a thing falls into place, I've heard this a hundred times, despite the number of times I've preached about it and explained it, I hear so many people saying, you know, everything fell into place. And it was nothing but God. No. It's not from God just because it fell into place, all right? It can fall into place because it's God, but that is not the ultimate criterion for whether it's from God. Because we have another person working against us. Who is that? Who is that? Satan. Satan can make you meet somebody who can take you down the garden path. It's not from God. Don't make flippant choices like Esau did. 
and he was called a profane person, a fornicator, who despised his birthright. The consequences of despising the birthright are enormous. The consequences of obeying God are troubling sometimes, but they have eternal dividends. I'm not telling you that when you obey God, it's going to be A-OK -okay and everything is going to be tickety-boo. No, the next moment you'll have trouble. Serve God. Obey Him. Hallelujah.